Well, first off, thank you so much, everybody, for coming out tonight. We're very excited to have you here. Uh, tonight, we're especially lucky to be graced with the presence of Natalia Zafnotsky, mm -hmm. uh, a alumnus of the division uh, and uh, someone who's put out a lot of really fantastic presentations for us uh, in person. And so we're really look looking forward to having her here online. Um, just in case anybody is new here, doesn't know what we're doing, um, these are going to be part of our regular Monday night training sessions. They're recorded and posted to YouTube. So if like some of the previous ones, there are uh, a lot of high level topics moved through in very quick speed. Uh, if you want to go back and refresh and review some of the stuff that was talked about, uh, it'll be posted to our YouTube in the next few days. So you can go and find it there. During these presentations, we're keeping everybody's microphones muted and video off except for a presenter. If you have questions, you can put them right into the chat box there. And Natalia has promised to watch it very closely and make sure everybody's questions do get answered, no matter how challenging or difficult. So you can throw the difficult ones right Jeez. in. There. <laughs> uh, if you do start to have some of the more complex questions that lead, that might need a back and forth conversation, as we get towards the uh, the end of the presentation, we'll have some open question time once Natalia has made it through everything she's wanting to discuss there. Uh, so I will pass it right over to Natalia now. Thanks for coming out, everyone. Wow, what an introduction, my goodness. <laughs> so hopefully it's a lot to live up to, so hopefully it's good. Okay, um, I just wanted to give you a little bit of background on who I am and like why I have been asked in the past to give this um, presentation. Um, as David said, my name is Natalia Saptochne. I finished my Bachelor's of Science in Kinesiology back in 2016. Um, during that time, I was I've worked in the behavioral medicine lab, the rehab neuroscience lab, um, both volunteering and working and doing some honors um, research. Um, I worked in a chronic pain clinic for five years and I was have previously been a member of Division 176 in Victoria. Um, I think I think six and a half years, so between 2012 and um, last year, some, I think August 2019. So, I really love um, all the ways in which that like pre-hospital care has kind of met my um, healthcare background, um, especially in kinesiology, which is the study of bodily movement. And um, this is a presentation that I've given many times or several times um, in Victoria. It was originally geared um, for some audience participation. So um, hopefully there's not too many gaps. I tried to take them out. I mean, hopefully it's not going to be too long. In the past, it's taken about an hour, hour and a half, but because I feel like I'm presenting to a void, like I might just run my mouth and we'll be here all night. Hopefully not. I'm sure David will uh, pull me off the stage. So anyways, let's get started. Okay, so what does MSK stand for? So it stands for the musculoskeletal system. And um, something else I wanted to mention about this presentation is that it shouldn't really be outside of your scope of MFR practice and protocol. Like um, I definitely took from the MFR and what we're building is just on top of it. So if you have your MFR as the foundation, this shouldn't be too far out of reach. Um, it's uh, the first part, especially, especially I, I found that people um, absolutely know what's happening. We'll talk about a little bit of planes and muscles and that kind of thing. And it's in the second half where we get into the assessment model that people get a lot of information. And um, uh, uh, that's where the, the skill set of being able to assess injuries um, on the field will, be, will come into play. So uh, musculoskeletal system specifically STIs. So in this case, we're talking about soft tissue injuries. Okay, so what is the MSK system made up of? We're looking at muscles and tensin, tendons, bones, cartilage, and ligaments. And we are going to group them into two separate categories, as you can see that they've been bullet point on either side of the screen into contractile tissue and inert tissue. And um, we'll talk about why this is important, why you would want to understand the differentiation. Okay, so we also, we need to talk about landmarking and we're gonna start first with planes. So looking at um, the three major global planes, um, 
that will help you in terms of landmarking when you're assessing um, being able to relate information to like if you're handing off care or telling someone about someone's specific injury everyone needs to be on the same page of uh, in terms of reference points so we want to divide the body into three different ways and uh, we have the frontal plane sagittal plane and the transverse plane also, if I'm going too fast, please um, put it in the chat and David will let me know as well. <clears throat> okay. So when we talk about a reference point, everything is in, term, in terms of anatomical position. So this is anatomical position, um, just taking care to notice that the palms are facing um, towards, towards, outwards, sorry, this is harder <laughs> to explain when I'm not in person. Um, and uh, as Anna once previously gave me the good insight, it's anatomical position because no bones are crossed. So everything is laid out. Um, and all landmarking, as I mentioned before, is, in ref is made in reference to this position. Going into further detail, so these are probably terms that everyone's seen before. Um, distal, further from the trunk, proximal, closer to the trunk, just more detail for landmarking again. Um, some of them can kind of be used interchangeably. Um, so for example, I would, I, I would use like inferior and, uh, and uh, distal in, you know, interchangeably depending on the um, context or the situation. Um, su superior proximal, um, same thing. Plantar dorsal is a more specific one related specifically to the foot. There is also one for the hand, which is palmar, palmar dorsal. So again, um, if you have the back of your hand facing outward, uh, the, the dorsal side of the body. So yeah. So nothing, hopefully that's not, that. hopefully that's something that everyone has seen before. Um, so in this, usually, I, sorry, this is kind of <laughs> a glaring image. Um, I usually have a couple of images where we kind of, as a group, uh, brainstorm how we would landmark something like this. Um, just for ease, I'll give like a couple of ways that you could, uh, you could write down the location of this abrasion. Um, you would say, so, so when we talk about right and left, just to clarify, it's always in terms of the patient's right and left. So this person's abrasion, I would say, would be the right posterior forearm inferior to the elbow. So that's one way of describing it. Um, there's another way of right dorsal forearm distal to the olecranon process. That's a more anatomical way of saying it. But in those two examples, the, the first one is more, I think it's easier for the average person to understand. Not everyone knows what the olecranon process looks like or is or where it's located. That's something that's very specific that maybe you would find on like an x-ray, um, x-ray results or something like that. So it's not always hyper important to have the most medical and anatomical and detailed position. You're trying to strike a balance between um, having enough detail and not also not overwhelming the person that you're telling it to. You don't want them to spend time being like, I don't understand, getting confused, that kind of thing. So uh, let's look at the next slide. So brace yourselves. Another thing when you're ident when you're landmarking something is, um, it, or when you're assessing an injury, is you're gonna be looking at what's the context of that injury. So on the left-hand side, we have someone with asymmetrical swelling. So we have on the, on the right ankle and foot, a lot of swelling as compared to his left. But on the, on the right picture, you can see that both feet are quite swollen and maybe that's the person's average. Maybe that's um, not normal. Like you're always comparing it to that person's normal. And we'll talk about this. I'll mention it a little bit in more detail later on of um, what is normal for one person might not be normal for another person. So, yeah. So comparing it to the other limb, um, yeah, we're not assessing in isolation. Sorry, I just have some notes down here as well. So this one is more in terms of pain. 
So you can see that there's two uh, area, two foci, and then there's some uh, gradation in between. Um, so I'll give you a couple more examples of like how I would um, landmark it. I would say that, you know, you could go from the, this person has pain radiating from the right occiput radiating to the right medial scapula. You could also say something much more simple. You could say the right base of skull radiating to the right medial shoulder blade. And you're getting the same information across. Um, again, it's a balance between the detail and having the, in, the listener understand quickly because you don't want them to be scratching their head or that kind of thing. If you are having difficulty uh, knowing how to landmark or what should be said first, it's always good to get the right and left done first or the, something more global that someone can pinpoint. Like people understand where the elbow is versus like the distal olecranon process. Um, you have right and left differentiating. Okay, so I immediately know which side of the body I'm supposed to be looking at and then narrowing, narrowing down to that specific point. Okay, good. So when do soft tissue injuries get assessed? So the arrows kind of will give us um, an exam, uh, some pointers to two locations well, where they will get assessed. So even before we touch the patient, like you can get a really good history that will indicate the severity of the injury, what the injury is and how it occurred, obviously, if you do your sample first. So um, because you're dealing with pain um, and potentially infection and all this other different stuff, you, you don't wanna rush in and touch the patient just yet. Um, so within the sample is, is where you're gonna get a lot of information, specifically your low tar OPQRST. And we'll go into a little bit more detail of where within that some other information we can get out. And then once you've gone through your sample, um, you can take a lot of time in your head to toe. So the assessment that I'm gonna teach you in, um, in a few short slides um, are kind of a combination of both. Like you can kind of do a modified head to toe. It's kind of like a modified head to toe, um, but you want to get the foundation of um, the history of the injury first before you start touching the patient. So it's a little bit. So it's a little bit of both. Okay. So when we talk about the quality or type, that can actually give us additional information as to what specific tissue is injured. So I've tried to color code it a little bit. So again, like the dull pink is the contractile tissue, the pale blue is the inert. Um, and I'm just going to um, bring your attention to certain, um, certain qualities of pain. So, so for example, you have a dull aching pain that is in both tissues, but you also have sharp, pain that is mostly centered to inert tissue. Um, in my experience, when I was, whenever I'd be taking someone's, um, you know, trying to get their, the, the quality of their pain, like I very, um, I would often give them like a slew of different characteristics that they could, I, they could choose. So like I say, like, is it a sharp shooting, stabbing pain, throbbing, aching, whatever, like just rattling off a bunch of stuff. So sometimes the patient themselves don't know how to characterize their pain best. They might think like it's sharp, but then actually, oh no, it's, it's more of a shooting quality that fits better with what I'm feeling. So I, I, I personally, I find that I like to rattle off a bunch so that they can choose. Um, and then, like I said, like certain characteristics will actually point to certain um, tissues just based on the structure of that tissue. And so we have more, um, we have the inert and then things like nerve root, ner nerve, bones, bones fracture, etc. So, um, yeah, in general, some symptoms are associated with having an increased association with certain tissues, but also, like I previously mentioned, it's not the be all to end all. Some people will qualify the same pain in different ways. So again, this is just like a general kind of um, grouping. Okay. When we are looking at someone's injury, and again, this is even before we've, we've, we have yet to touch the patient. We're just looking at what their injury looks like. Um, I kind of have a Venn diagram here because the three, the posture deformity, swelling, edema, color, atrophy, and the abnormal pattern of movement 
kind of can cross into each other. So for example, like swelling and edema um, can influence and cause abnormal pattern of movement. Um, obviously abnormal pattern of movement can be influenced or influence posture, et cetera. So there's a lot of overlapping. I think that swelling edema, color atrophy, pretty ob pretty self-explanatory. We can see like, like someone's sprained ankle here, um, pretty, pretty ubiquitous, like we've seen it before. I found a couple of videos, um, let me see if this will work, of, uh, in the case of the posture deformity, kind of a little bit deceiving. So in this one, it's a young female and it's her forearm. Let me just see if this will load. So this patient has some trauma to the forearm, starting on the elbow and going down radius and all that. So what this guy is explaining is that she has a huge contusion on the side of her forearm, but as the x-ray shows, there's actually no fracture. So he's panning up and down, showing that the bone is still intact. And then I will just um, kind of skip forward here. And you can see that huge bump, that kind of, that, that, that deformity that I would probably, probably say was, I would assume that it's a fracture, especially if she has a lot of pain. Um, but again, looks can be deceiving and just like, this is a soft tissue injury, which is um, within her scope. And, but there's, there's not really much that you can do other than um, splint them and send them to the hospital. So just wanted to, to bring that to your attention. And then the other one, this one, the abnormal pattern of movement is something that requires a little bit more experience to be able to identify and get a feel for. Um, that This is something that I did a lot in my chronic pain clinic where you would see so many different people walk in with different ways of movement. So bringing your attention here to his left scapula is super elevated and so when they work together, it's a little bit better, but in isolation, his left scapula like really elevates. Um, his right one is in a much better um, pattern of movement. And that could be something from like overuse or um, an injury that was never treated well. Um, sorry, here we go. Okay. So the abnormal pattern of movement, again, this is not something like in the case of the guy's scapula, he, we could compare his left to his right and his right looked really normal and his left obviously was the abnormal one, but maybe both of them were both elevated and that would indicate something else and you would maybe treat it something else. But in this case, especially with him, that's more of a chronic issue, not something that you would necessarily see in the field. Um, like with anything else, you, you can always ask the patient, is this normal for you? Because we're comparing the patient to themselves, right? Okay. Looking specifically at patterns of movement, the anatomy of the joints. Um, oh yeah, something that, sorry, just looking at my notes. Look, uh, going back to the abnormal pattern of movement, um, the human body is amazing at compensating for atypical movements. And like, once you start to assess people's like gait and posture and that kind of thing, and you will see the most like hunched over crippled looking people with no pain and someone else who's walking upright and whatever with like a lot of pain because of just their body's ability to compensate for certain things and certain um, traumas, physical traumas that they've received, whether it's through like a car accident or, um, just chronic overuse or that, that sort of thing. Okay, anyways, anatomy of joints. So looking at the different joints, um, the specific ones we'll, we'll most likely see are shoulder injuries, knees, ankles, wrists, hips, um, possibly some necks, um, elbows sometimes, a little bit less often, I would say. Um, but each joint has specific ranges of motion, of movement, and, and regular patterns. Um, some of them are more um, intuitive than others. I will try to um, 
demonstrate some of them. Basically, I would say that when you're looking to um, identify whether something is inflection or extension, um, when you are close, I would say when you're closing an angle that's flexion, so with like your elbow, so this would be flexion, this would be extension. Um, same thing with your knee, that when you pull, if you can see it, pull your knee together, that's flexion, this is extension. Um, shoulders and hips are similar. So the ABD, ADD is uh, abduction. So you're being abducted by aliens. And then adduction is you're adding your arms back to your body. A lot of new, not, new, not, uh, mnemonics um, come into play um, when you're trying to memorize all the stuff in anatomy, which I think David is probably experiencing as he mentioned to me that he's in a, in a first year anatomy course, which is awesome. Um, for shoulders, you have, um, it's hard to see, but you have internal rotation, external rotation. Um, again, hard to tell, but um, my, it's not that my forearm is moving, it's that it's, that it's moving at this joint up here at the shoulder. Um, for the forearm, you would have supination, pronation, those types of things, um, ankles. Ankles, and so because ankles and are specifically located because of the how with the feet and that kind of thing, you have dorsiflexion, which is um, flexing towards the sky, and plantar flexion is uh, flexing is it's like pointing your toes down towards the ground. Um, you also have inversion and eversion, which is really subtle movement of inversion towards and eversion out. So if you see people who have who are um, who are flat footed, they are. Um, everting and then people who walk on the outside of their feet are inverting. So anyways, these are really important because when you are assessing a joint, you want to assess it through all of its ranges of movement um, and make sure that and compare and, and we'll talk about this, but comparing the um, healthy limb to the injured limb and back and forth to see one's personal one's personal range of movement. So as I mentioned before, our body's really great at compensating for different things, um, but some people are just naturally more flexible than others. And like, for example, someone with like, um, who's super like hyper mobile, you actually might not be able to get a good assessment on them because they can go through the full hundred plus range of movement and um, have no pain. They just are super flexible even though they have an injury. So anyways. Something to think about, something to investigate to make sure that you're looking at all the ranges of movement for that specific joint. Okay, this is the meat and potatoes of your, of the skill set that you want to learn to be able to assess different soft tissue injuries. So we'll specifically be looking at active range of movement, passive, and resisted. Um, and the goal is to provoke an abnormal response. So that will often be pain. So someone will only be able to move um, until they reach pain. And again, like we were looking at the different, the quality of pain that they're experiencing, um, their range of mo movement will also tell us what tissue might be at fault, might be the injured one. <clears throat> and in general, like we're like, as with everything else, we're not diagnosing, we're just trying to get, gain as much information as possible. The way that I'll present this to you sounds very clear and sounds like, oh, like if I just do this and then do this and then I'll get this answer and I'll know what it is. But oftentimes um, injuries with an injury, like if you sprain your ankle or your wrist or your elbow or whatever, um, there's lots of tissues that are involved and you might not really know what, which one specifically was a primary um, injury until you know, a week or a couple of weeks or even months down the road, just as your body is healing and um, able to differentiate between um, injuries. Okay. So with this diagram, I just want you to pay attention to the fact that we have the three ranges of movement and we're, we've coupled active range of movement and passive. Um, and that will be really important um, in a few slides. Um, there's some additional information that you can gain from passive range of movement and resisted range of movement. Um, and again, but in general, we're looking to uh, provoke an abnormal response. And we'll talk about what all of these look like in a second. Okay. 
So the first one you're going to do is active range of movement. So this is where you are asking the patient to move their own limbs. And you're always going to assess the healthy limb first and assess the injured in comparison. Uh, I'm going to ask a rhetorical question. Why do you think you would do the active range of movement before the rest, before passive and resisted? The answer is that you want the person who's been injured to, to move their own limb. So to give you like um, wrist extension and flexion and ulnar deviation and radial deviation because they will show you how quickly they go into pain. So if they say like, if they go like, this is as far as, far as I go, if you did pass the range of movement first, you're not like you would just shove their, their wrist into whatever, like you already have an idea of like, okay, so this is the one that's really painful for them. I won't try to move it too far, but they have full range and flexion, let's say and that kind of thing. So they are, they are going to be giving you the context for how quickly they uh, experience pain and how resisted their, their range of movement is. It also gives an, so willingness to move and their general limitations. Once you can see it, um, as, I, as it's mentioned here, if possible, do the most painful movement last because um, once you, because of the uh, inflammatory process, once you start um, kind of aggravating their pain, it's not gonna stop for a while. So in, you want to be able to get a really clear idea of which movements is more painful than the other ones. Okay, in passive range of movement, you as the provider, as the medic, you are now moving the patient's limbs. So uh, you're gonna look at your um, placement of your hands as you're stabilizing, and it's always ab above and below the joint because you want to isolate. Um, and again, you, you should have already received consent before, um, but it's kind of good to ask again, just to, do you mind if I move your limbs? And like, can I move your limbs? Because um, they're in pain and you will be causing them a little bit of pain. Hopefully, you know, you're going to be moving slowly, but um, just something to, to, to think about and keep in mind. And the reason why you want to be really uh, clear about where you're stable is where you're placing your hands is you want to stabilize the joint. You want, not sorry, not stabilize so much as really isolate the movement of the joint. You don't want to accidentally be incorporating movements from other parts of the, the, um, the limb. So uh, for example, it's actually fairly, you can get a good reading on the wrist, but you have a bunch of tiny little bones in here that are really hard to make sure they don't move. Um, the same thing with basically everywhere else other than maybe like the knee. Um, yeah. Okay. Some additional information, and this is just for interest sake, um, but some additional information that you will be receiving through passive range of movement is uh, something called end feels. So this is, end feels are totally out of our scope. This is something that is developed similar to abnormal pattern of movement, developed after a lot, a lot of experience. So um, PTs, uh, physiotherapists, athletic therapists, um, massage therapists, like all of these therapists, um, they're the ones that are getting a really good idea of potentially what what could be going on based on end feels and you have to feel like a lot of injured joints to be able to identify them uh, because a lot of them sound similar to each other so in this slide we can see like a normal so normal seems pretty clear like hard soft elastic so hard bone to bone that would be an example of like a um full elbow extension it's a bone on, bone on bone approximation that is causing the end. Uh, that's the feel at the end of the range of movement. A soft would be the opposite, would be flexion. Usually it's the muscle here of your bicep and your forearm that is limiting the range of movement. So that's a, that's a soft tissue approximation. Elastic tissue capsule stretch is, um, I think it's similar to, uh, I wanna say, at like your within your hands something that is very like ligament and tendon based i don't remember if it's abnormal and and isolating uh an abnormal end feel has to be done 
before swelling and edema has entered the area. So if you've ever seen like an athletic therapist or PT like rush onto the field, start immediately like touching someone or whatever, that kind of thing, um, it's because they're trying to figure out, um, they're trying to feel the end field before swelling enters the area and kind of muddles everything up. And again, this is just for your interest sake, like you, this is not really something that's in our scope, but like even like springy, the difference between springy, spasm, um, boggy, those are all kind of, they seem kind of similar to me. Um, empty is pretty obvious if, if it's limited by pain that like they can't actually do anything because it's so painful, which is kind of like a, an end feel, not really, but it's a, it's a qualifier. Okay, so that would be something that if someone's doing passive range of movement that they would be looking for, but for us, it's not, it's not, a, it's not within our scope. Okay. So like I mentioned before, we're coupling active range of motion with passive range of motion. And we'll be using specifically pain because that's probably the clearest um, and most common um, qualifier. If the pain is in the same direction, so for example, you ask, you've, you've done all of your active range of movement first. You said, okay, can you flex? Can you extend? Can you deviate in both ways? And they say like, oh my gosh, it hurts so much with wrist flexion. And it hurts a little bit with wrist extension, but mostly wrist flexion. And then when you move them, so you so you would be you'd be gripping maybe here, and you'd be pushing, and that person saying, "Ow, that really hurts." And here, not so much. This is pretty good. This is okay. Um, that's a sign that so if it's in the same direction, that's a sign that it's it's probably an inert tissue. So those are the things like the ligaments and the cartilage and that kind of thing. If it's in opposite direction, so for example, they've identified it hurts doing this. But then when you push, nothing. But then when you go to the opposite and they say, ow, that's an indicator that it's a, it's a contractile tissue. So again, this is where you would think like, oh, this is really clear. Like I just have to identify where their pain is. But the thing is once swelling has been introduced into the area, um, a whole bunch of other things, the inflammatory process has started. Person's probably gonna be in a general amount of pain. They, they might be able to, depending on the injury, they might be able to still identify pretty clearly. Um, also, depends that pain, also depends on that person's pain threshold. Some people are more sensitive to pain. Some people are on the zero to five scale like all the time. There's very little for, in ways of them going above that 50 percentile mark. So um, yeah, something to include uh, uh, when, you're, when, you, when you're getting your history of like, okay, what's the context for how this person interprets pain um, might be helpful. Yeah, okay. Okay, so we've coupled active range of movement and passive range of movement. And now we're going to add resistive range of movement as um, kind of additional information. And we're looking at grades of, actually, okay, sorry, actually, I'm gonna go back. This is some additional information that I didn't have in my the previous presentations. Um, you can actually, so uh, just the bottom where it says in nervous is contractile. So this is the difference between um, a sprain and a strain. And you can actually grade them similarly to um, the resistance range of movement and strength that um, I kind of gave you a sneak peek of. But you can have a three point scale of sprains and strains grade one being minor. So they're mild tearing of the, of the muscle fibers or ligament, and it's a moderate inflammatory response. Grade two would be severe tearing. It's a large amount of swelling and bruising. So this is, um, again, going back to like, you can see this is just looking at the injury first off without even, um, without even um, putting your hands on the patient. Grade three is complete rupture of structure, massive swelling and dark colored bruising. There's no pain and there's no end feels because the structures have ruptured so severely. So um, something to think about in the back of your head of like everything is a gradation, everything is a spectrum in terms of strength and pain and, that, and um, contusion. Okay, so this is resisted range of movement, so aka strength. Um, and what we're doing here is we're just, again, getting a general idea of severity. So uh, again, a three point scale. So the, these kind of, you're doing the same, all the full ranges of movement as you would do in your active and passive. Um, but this time you are putting them in a neutral position and trying to assess all the ranges, ranges of movement in that neutral position. 
And what I have put in quotes is don't let me move you. So basically you'll say like, I want you to press down on my hand, but don't let me move you. So you are applying the opposite strength so that they are testing. So for example, with wrist um, flexion, so they would be trying to bend down and maybe you're, you're pushing up so that they're, can, they stay in the neutral position, but they're applying in specific ways, if that makes sense. Um, and again, you're just getting an idea of um, their strength and, and uh, pain with that movement. So if they're still strong, but it's painful, hurts a lot, grade one. Grade two is if they're super weak, that means that often means that the, the you providing the resistance are able to move them and it's painful, so grade two. Grade three is weak and, and pain-free. So again, that's usually because structures have ruptured and um, there's not much for them to go on in terms of being able to move their, their um, tissues. <clears throat> okay. This um, will go into some uh, questions and examples. Div 176, unless you totally forget, you can't answer <laughs> because these are the same old questions that I've asked before. But I do want um, people in the chat to respond <coughs> to this question. And then maybe we can take um, a little break for additional questions after these practice ones. So our question one is like, so we have active range of movement. So this is at the ankle. So dorsiflexion, plantar flexion. So um, I want people to identify what tissue is injured and then what grade is it? And I need to figure out how to get to the chat. Oh, sorry, I'm, I am catching up in the chat. David, you should tell me. <laughs> um, okay, if anybody wants to, Div 176. Um, resisted range of movement is, um, it's, it's not important here. I, I just wanna know the, um, the grade Oh wait, no, sorry, I do have it on the, what am I talking about? On the right hand side, resisted range of movement. Yeah, it's against resistance, that's right. Yeah, dorsal and plantar would be feet. Yeah, so it's specifically the ankle itself, not the foot. Um, yeah. Yeah, great too, that's right. Can anyone identify what the, tissue, whether it's contractile or inert, is at play here is the injured tissue, whether it's like ligaments, cartilage, or maybe it's muscles and tendons. So I'm just catching up on the chat. <clears throat> yeah, contractile, yeah, great. Um, okay. Great. Okay. Sorry. I was just catching up in the chat. Okay. Question two. Um, so we're looking at this is, um, I don't know what I decided what joint this would be. Let's say it is the, oh, dorsiflexion, plantar flexion. Um, I guess is the ankle as well. I know I was thinking potentially knee, but then I saw that I had put dorsiflexion, plantar flexion in the resistive range of movement. So um, yeah, no, me too. <laughs> and, I, and I was the one who created this presentation. <laughs> okay. So this one, I just want you to just, just identify what the um, tissue, the potential tissue, uh, the tissue that's damaged is. Yep, that's right, it's an inert tissue. So 
um, pretty straightforward when it's and when when it's laid out plainly like this, like oh, pain and flexion, no pain and extension. Um, lots of pain with flexion again, but um, no pain and extension again. So, um, and then I put in a little note in the bottom: pain upon palpation along medial joint line. So um, that's you're like again with palpation, like you might actually want to. Um, Put your hands on that person and see different areas of the joint or the or or the bones on either side or the ligaments or tendons to see if you can see, feel ruptures or damage or contusions or bruising or swelling or that kind of thing. So, again, as as much as that person, um, I can't remember Patricia to be honest. Like I put this together a long time ago. It could the only the only problem is the dorsiflexion plantar flexion which i might have thrown in by accident from a previous the previous question but yeah okay let's go to the second question but palpation what i was saying before is palpation um only as much as the person can handle as well right like you don't want to be causing them undue pain if you don't have to you want to be able to um, get as much information as possible without t touching the patient and then um only palpating and moving if as, as much as you need to. Okay, so this is looking at the forearm. So supination, um, the mnemonic that was give, well, that was taught to me in my anatomy class was um, you want to, uh, you want some soup. So this is supination, this is supination, and then the opposite is pronation. So it's dumping it out, but soup, put your hands up for soup. Um, and that's actually what helps me remember for the full body. Yep, it is grade one, that's right. Do we know which um, tissue is injured? So because the pain is in opposite direction, so this person has pain um, in supination as well as in pronation with passive range of movement. Um, it's a contractile injury, tissue injury. Um, and then, yep, that's right. Thanks, Carly. Then does can anyone think of a really simple way to test resistive range of movement? So if you're trying to limit someone from pushing my hand, yeah, it's an even simpler one, which I'll, it's it's a handshake. So you can get the person to grip your hand and like it takes some isolation of the wrist because you don't want the wrist to be to be moving at all, but you can grip them and um, get them to, to move within that handshake. Okay. Um, let me pause here as we have basically finished the bulk of the assessment and um, that's that's basically all you need to be able to assess an entry. We'll talk about now what you need to do after you, you're finished your assessment you feel like you have a good idea of what's going on, um, that they don't have to immediately go to hospital, um, that they can just stay in your care for a little bit longer. Um, Make sure that I am. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Uh, I just want to briefly pause here if anyone has, <clears throat> excuse me, any questions or anything like that. The one downfall from doing this over Zoom is that um, we don't have a break to be able to practice on each other, which is what I would normally do here, just that people can get used to um, putting their hands on someone else's limbs because it can be. Um, not intuitive as of with everything else like for example taking vitals the more the more that you practice it the easier it is and the more that you'll just realize where you need to put your hands to isolate movements and that kind of thing um kinesiology is very kinetic yeah that's right yeah um should we do like a Five minute break, how, does, how do people feel? With the handshake, would you support the elbow joint? Um, yeah, you could even ask them to try to, you could even do it so you can get them to tuck the elbow into their own body because otherwise it'd be kind of awkward to, to try to reach around to get them to, to isolate on the other side. 
Um, and, and because of where the supination is happening and the way that the, the bones move in the forearm, um, you would actually be isolating above, I would say probably above the elbow because of, again, just because of how the bones are moving. The forearm is kind of particular because it's not as straightforward as the, straightforward as the other joints. Um, so you can just get them to tuck the, their, their upper arm into their body and then do it from there. Yeah. Yeah, I also have a lot of other mnemonics if people want them later, but um, I was going to give, unless there's any more questions, it'd be just like a couple minute break here. We can pause. Okay. So you've identified what's injured. For the most part, you have some idea of what tissue might be injured. Um, what do you do next? So we're gonna look at some stages of healing and why that's relevant to us. So uh, these are kind of four bigger, more overarching stages, depending on what resource you look at it might give you a different idea, a different um, progression. But Generally speaking, you have like the acute trauma, so bleeding, inflammation, repair, and then remodeling. So we will specifically be looking at inflammation in terms of um, soft tissue injury um, and like why it's important to us. So in general, it's, a, it's an immune response. Um, and uh, inflammation can be both acute and chronic. So some people have whole systemic inflammation um, that they struggle with. This case, we will, it's usually what we would call acute inflammation. If the process is not stopped in a healthy way, it can continue on and cause chronic inflammation, which is something that um, I saw a lot in my chronic pain clinic that when acute injuries and traumas are not taken care of, um, in a timely response, in a really uh, well-organized response, they can kind of um, spiral out of control that the body has a hard time figuring out when it's uh, in pain and when it's not. So um, yeah, this is why it's important for us to be aware of inflammation as well. Um, and in general, in general, it's uh, an immune response. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. That like inflammation can be kind of it's in the same area for sure because um, what you're be what you're looking for is the diff is potentially infection sometimes. So, um, what we are looking at in inflammation, um, oftentimes like what it says on the screen, edema enters the area due to chemical mediators, which creates a hypoxic environment and ultimately slows healing. So the other thing about this is that. Um, you can have a bunch of detrimental variables and you can kind of segregate them between intrinsic and extrinsic. So intrinsic being um, biological, biochemical, biomechanical. So those are things like the tearing of the tissues itself, that kind of thing that the um, inflammation is trying to target, but it could also be extrinsic factors so like pathogens, um, toxins, allergens, that kind of thing that could enter into the open area and cause a bigger issue. So the inflammation process is actually super, super complex because it has both a, a pro-inflammatory response than an anti-inflammatory response. Yeah, so we'll talk about massage and heat in a second and why. That's right, it can be really helpful. Um, but in this, in this process, um, you have all these chemical mediators um, that are trying to identify, okay, we wanna get rid of this necrotic tissue, we want to ward off these foreign invaders, um, there's all this cell, cellular, cellular and metabolic involvement. Um, so really complex process that we actually don't have like fully understand um, because it also involves the immune system and all those kind of things. Um, the reason for uh, resolution, so like um, 
like I've identified that it ultimately slows healing is because it kind of just floods the area and we kind of need to get certain, certain parts of that inflammation out so that true healing can start. Um, the body is a kind of a funny thing that it can kind of shoot itself in, in, the own, in its own foot, which is a meta metaphor. Um, but in its, in its kind of uh, over eager attempt to try to help this, this, this injury, it's actually causing more harm. So um, the reasons why we want to move on from inflammation, because we want to avoid unnecessary tissue damage, we want, to re um, we want a reduction of the energy loss because um, it, uh, this healing process is very like, expensive for the body. Um, so we want to kind of get the process moving. Um, cellular and homeostasis costs and um, general pain relief. So, so what does this mean? So, and again, as M. Ashton, sorry, I don't, I don't think I know your first name. Um, you can use the SHARP acronym to identify, again, without even having to touch the patient, whether um, an inflammatory process has started. So swelling, heat, altered function, redness, pain. So um, if you've done your sample, if you've done your load to ARP or OPQRST, like you'll, you'll have already seen this. Yeah, and like I said, until the inflammatory process stops, true healing cannot start. Um, this is why we apply and give out ice with an asterisk, which why I will address in a couple, in uh, I think the next slide. Yeah. Um, okay. So um, in our protocol with MFR and St. John Ambulance, the biggest thing we can do is give ice. Okay, great. Thanks, Mike. Um, which we often use the acronym RICE, but I want to introduce a different acronym to you, which is MEAT or MEF. <laughs> so uh, we typically know RICE to be rest, ice, compression, elevation, which some people are saying is an outdated um, way of addressing soft tissue injuries um, because what it is outlining is something in opposition to the nature of soft tissues, which is to immobilize completely. Um, and when I say immobilize, I don't mean like that you're necessarily putting it into a cast, but um, you, it could be even as simple as um, completely staying off of that limb or not using that joint at all. Um, using too much ice, um, using uh, compression actually is okay. Um, elevation is in kind of in the same camp as rest. Um, rice is advantageous for the first 24 to 48 hours because um, ice can provide an analgesia um, and um, as well as reducing the amount of swelling that goes and the compression will do this as well, reduce the amount of swelling that's happening there. Um, so that can help in the first 24 hours, but after that you want to move towards the MEAT acronym. Um, yeah, RICE is good for acute injuries and reducing pain. And then meet movement, exercise, analgesia, treatment. Um, like I just said about the nature of soft tissues is that they're made to move, like that's their complete function. And when you go against the nature of it, you're actually going to inhibit the health of that area of those tissues and the future prognosis for their health as well. So in some ways, the meat um, acronym is not as discreet as race because um, obviously movement and exercise sound very similar as do analgesia and treatment, but um, it, it is more of a gradation. Movement, what we're talking about here is um, smaller, smaller movements um, to encourage collagen repair and other repairs into the right movement patterns. So if you completely to mobilize that joint, um, you might uh, you might get weird patterns of, of like protection against that joint and ligaments and tendons and whatever versus movement. If you start moving it just in the normal um, ranges of movement, it, the body will be able to uh, apply protection in the correct way. So it'll be like, oh, okay, so we need, we need more movement here. Let's, let's provide a little bit more elasticity here and a little bit more structure on the outside or whatever. Um, and that's just really, really gentle movements. And again, this is after the first, I would say 48 hours. And it can be very, very subtle with increasing, um, increasing, um, uh, like with just, like you're increasing it slowly. Uh, 
yeah exercise is more targeted so that's something that you might do with like a pt like a physiotherapist or an athletic therapist or even your massage therapists are um, very well trained um, they go through one of my good friends just became an RMT and I was surprised by the amount of depth that she had to study and learn. And they can also give sometimes good exercises if they know their stuff. I mean, um, use your common sense, um, but they can also be super helpful. The thing with like um, why meat is a good movement and why you don't want to stay in the area of rice is that areas like cartilage, tendons, um, bone they all have poor vascularization so they have poor blood supply so if you stay in that Im immobilization area of, of rest ice compression elevation um, they won't get that good supply from from the bloodstream so meat is more advantageous for that it's going to naturally um, introduce all those helpful more more helpful chemical mediators and um, even be able just like the the muscles around that joint even be able to help move edema out of that that area as well just because of, of the, the the pump and uh, of the muscle contractions around that area um i do have a note here that says that like meat should not be used for severe or full uh ruptures um so again use your common sense when you're advising or if you're in the state that you don't want to be moving something that is actually not attached to itself so um yeah so you're so so going back to movement exercise moving it in an organized way in a way that helps put stress and load on the area um that is very specific so why exercise is after movement exercise again these are like more focused ways of moving the body maybe maybe with additional load with supervision maybe with resistant resistance band etc that kind of thing um it will also help reduce muscle atrophy uh it will decrease the disuse of disuse that comes from uh, the osteoporosis that comes from disuse because your bones actually need um, good tension on them to maintain good uh, bone health. Um, it will help decrease the thickened scar tissue and decrease joint stiffness. So, talking about acute and chronic inflammation, um, yes, I will explain traction. Yeah, as I'll move over to meth. Uh, yeah. So the so so the meat um, acronym has is is what's been developed in order to help combat the chronic inflammation process that can happen when the acute inflammation process uh, spirals. Yeah. Um, going to eight analgesia. Uh, this is basically you don't want to be doing any of this in extreme pain or duress. We don't you know we don't want to be martyrs out there or anything like that. Um, so if you need certain analgesics like go for it. There is some argument, some conversation about whether non-steroidal anti-inflammatories are good or not. Some people say they can be good in the first get-go, like those are things like ibuprofen, um, naproxen, aspirin. Um, some people say that you should not take them because you want a little bit of an inflammatory process to help continue the movement in those areas. So that's why they would say like Tylenol or acetaminophen. Um, so there's some back and forth about what's a better uh, analgesic to use, um, but but something that's pretty, uh, I would say, inert is a, a topical like a uh, like Voltaren, which is I think diclofenac um, often used. You can get like a higher concentration from the pharmacy um, through a through a uh, prescription. And this again, like a spectrum, like analgesia kind of goes into treatment that um, you might want to get further help for um, movements as well as uh, pain relief. So things like physiotherapists, chiros, like acupuncture, prolotherapy, all of those things can be advantageous for that. Um, thanks, Dr. Mike. Yeah, that's good. Um, Okay, so going to quickly going over meth, I kind of put it in small print because it's not as well known and um, but it is kind of out there in the literature. Um, but it's similar in the sense to me in the sense of it's it's more of a long term care plan. So you want to do movement, um, a little bit of maybe elevation like that could be in the form of rest that or even to help produce um, help promote uh, edema uh, drainage lymph fluid drainage away from the joint that's inflamed um, traction i would say that's probably in the realm of um, a professional doing that that's not really something that 
um, I would recommend someone doing for themselves. Um, sometimes that can be very helpful, especially if you have already gained some stiffness or um, thickened scar tissue or that kind of thing. Just getting an, an, an outward um, traction on that joint can be helpful um, to make sure that it's in the right area and to just, um, yeah, get some, get some outward kind of external um, influence. Um, yeah, I have here, especially with a, with a professional. And then heat, I will address heat in the, I think, next slide. And someone else mentioned talking about massage and heat. Massage and heat can be helpful. Yeah, improve blood flow, that kind of thing. So, um, great. So here we go. Hope everyone's doing well. We're just over an hour, we're just about an hour in. Okay, so we'll, so we have the rice and some other modalities that exist. So we'll talk, so let's talk about rice a little bit longer just to give you an idea of what we can be doing. Um, because oftentimes at sporting events, people come up to us, ask us for ice or we apply ice or that kind of thing. The rule of thumb is about 10 to 15 minutes. Um, it's never directly on the skin, so you're not putting the ice cubes directly on the person's skin. Usually you want to wrap it in at least several uh, plastic bags or that kind of thing. Ice is kind of funnily enough, is often the, uh, very poorly used. Like it's not, actually, it's not used effectively because um, you actually want to keep ice on the area long enough for that area to go numb. Um, there's another acronym called CBAN, C-B-A-N. And it stands for the, the feeling of what will happen when someone applies ice. So I'm just gonna type it into the chat. So it's, uh, so you, the process is cold, burning, aching, numbness. It actually hurts to have ice on to the point of numbness. It's not a comfort, comfortable process. Once you get to the, air, to the, to the stage of numbness is um, that area of analgesia, but the process in between is not very comfortable. And I think a lot of times that people can't, either don't have enough ice to make it that far or it's too uncomfortable for them to push it that way. Um, yeah, so this, so if you were doing the C-band protocol, like um, you just have to be very careful. And I don't know if I would, I don't know, I, I'm not 100% sure about whether we can endorse that with St. John Ambulance. It's better just do 10 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes on and then off. The c -band protocol is like you go until numbness and then um, you remove it until you can feel that area again before you reapply the ice. Um, I, um, sorry, Michael, I'm just reading your, your comment in the chat. Um, I don't know um, if it matters how often you're icing and re-icing just because in an ideal situation, you're only icing for like 24 hours um, just to help prevent too much swelling in the area and um, too much pain before you move into an area of meat, which would help increase the blood flow and that kind of thing. I don't know if that answers your question. Okay. So the other modalities that um, one might use, again, this is more for interest sake, not really in our protocol. This is something that an athletic therapist would do, athletic trainer, um, um, a PT, that kind of thing, heat stretch, stretch and massage. And the reason why they're really not in our protocol is because they're used in very specific contexts. So um, I've explained it on, it says right there, like heat is rarely used for acute care because it's going to increase a lot of blood flow to the area. It's going to cause relaxation, um, which is not something that you necessarily want if you have a lot of bleeding and swelling in the first 20 to 24 to 48 hours. So that's something that um, oftentimes you hear with people who have chronic pain who will, who will um, use heat, heating pads, hot baths, saunas, that kind of thing. Stretch, stretching. Um, it can be used in acute, acute care, but with discretion. So this is something that um, you kind of have to be trained in because you can apply good stretching techniques for, for acute injuries like that are um, 
musculoskeletal injuries that are like uh, things that are like cramping. So if you have like a, a, an extreme muscle cramp, that would be a good time when stretching would be advantageous. Um, and as mentioned there, decreases adhesions and stress, increases flexibility. So um, yeah, so, and if you've ever done any kind of sports, there's, there's also the conversation about like um, static versus dynamic stretching and like how much stretching you should be doing before you go out. Like um, stretching is, is, is kind of, I would say like skewy territory. Like it, there's a lot of different um, opinions out there and it, this is really just for one's information. Yeah. Like CPR changes all the time. Yeah. It really depends. And there's still so much about the body that we don't know. And especially in my time in the, in the chronic pain clinic, there's the, the medical system in general is actually really poor at um, identifying and um, diagnosing soft tissue injuries. So we, we have lots of imaging that does well for like blood flow, um, like fMRIs for like x-rays, um, that kind of thing. But it's really hard to tell when a muscle is in hyper contraction in a, in a disadvantageous way um, that is actually causing like a disease process. Um, that is causing someone's pain, but anyways, I'm going off the rails a little bit. Okay, number four. That's right, yeah. Yeah, that's right. This is this is really aftercare info, yeah. Um, sorry, Patricia, which does which help with lactic acid buildup? The stretching? Uh, massage. Um, um, I don't know what you mean by lactic acid buildup. Do you mean like, let me, let me, um, touch, like touch base with massage and see if that answers any of your questions. Um, massage again, rarely used for acute, uh, care. Um, that's just something that like someone who has, who is done, who is off the field, they're no longer, um, this is also something m more for like chronic injuries and that kind of thing. Um, you don't want to ever like stretch someone or massage someone into such a point of relaxation and send them back on the field because they will be at an increased risk of re-injury or um, of a worse injury. But massage can be really good because um, similar to like the MEAT acronym of movement and exercise, um, it decreases adhesions um, and stress, increases blood flow, flow, relaxation, flexibility. And it's only really used when you know someone is going to be resting for a bit. Um, so my knowledge of in exercise physiology and lactic acid buildup. Yeah, so so lactic acid buildup in, in, in from my background is that it's more of a, uh, and this is a few years, a transitory state. So when you are working out and you feel that your muscles are burning, that is an increased lactic acid in that area. But as soon as you stop burning, your body has already reconverted a lot of that lactic acid into energy. Um, so the the idea about like ice packs to overworked muscles hmm if you're asked before i don't know if i can comment of ice packs and overworked muscles oh so in the sense of like um an ice bath or that kind of thing even um yeah, like that's that could be that, but you would be targeting the um, the inflammatory process as well. Like you can have low grade inflammatory processes. Yeah. So, but again, like some people swear by like ice baths. Other people f feel like they are useless. There, um, I didn't have him personally as a prof, but there was a um, MD who was also teaching um, uh, acute. Uh, care and prevention of acute injuries. And I think he basically told people that ice is useless. You should never apply ice because you want to get the injured limb moving as soon as possible. Yeah. So this is another slide 
um, that is just for interest sake. This is similar to Enfields where this is something that in my background that I think um, is really interesting to people, but <clears throat> excuse me, definitely not in our scope, not something that you should try to do or advise someone to do or anything like that because it takes a lot of training to tape people. Um, wrapping we have in our kits and we can kind of do that. Um, but again, you have to know how to wrap and you need to, so you need to practice a lot um, with someone who can guide you in terms of being able to stabilize the right, um, knowing the right way to stabilize the injured tissue. Um, so not to, if, if you want to err on the side of caution, like don't do either, uh, pass it over to someone um, who knows what they're doing into higher care. But taping is really interesting because of um, its strength and, and um, what you can kind of get away with when you tape up a joint. Um, I had, I talked to one of my friends who is um, an athletic therapist and um, he was, he was surprised that like taping was on my slide or in my, in my PowerPoint presentation because he's like, oh, I didn't know St. John and Amos can do that. I'm like, no, they can't. This is just for interest sake. But um, he gave his own kind of, um, his own point of view that like oftentimes you will see people who are taped up and playing on the field, but those people are, are some who are getting some um, additional stabilization from the tape because, um, but they are like an 80% strength and 100% um, range of motion. So it's a, it's a little bit uh, helpful, but um, it's not something that we would, we would do. Sorry, I'm just going to look at the chat. <laughs> okay. When you are wrapping, though, so these do's and don'ts can be applied to wrapping. Um, just what it says here, support protecting tissues without limiting function, support during immediate healing uh, phases after rehab um, to protect at-risk structures. So this is more of something like you're, you're not immobilizing like the way you would do with a splint. You're also not um, completely giving it freedom by like not giving it anything. It's kind of like this in-between process that is um, almost like a proprioceptive mechanism to help the person remember, don't move this limb. Because um, when you are wrapping someone, so for example, just say they have injury with flexion that they've hyper flexed their limb and this is really, really painful you would actually wrap someone so they are in a little bit of an extended um, position because when they would try to flex down, they would not flex to the point of pain yet, but it's enough flexing to remind them, don't, don't go into that area of movement. Same way for the opposite direction that like if they had hyperextended their wrist, which happens a lot when you, like, can, when you fall, um, you would you would wrap that person in, in a in a semi uh, flexed position so that when they would try to go into extension, the proprioceptive mechanism of the wrap, which it has these elastic elastic properties, would remind that person don't move it into that direction. So, um, yeah. So oftentimes, if you are at a sporting event, we would I can't remember how many times people would come over and be like, hey, can you tape up this this joint for me or that kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. Chris, yeah, um, just tape it up so they can go back out there. So they, one, are assuming um, our, they're, they're overestimating our ability in this area, and two, we're not taking the liability for what happens if we tape someone, they go back out onto the, onto the field. Yeah, it can be, yeah. And um, when, I was, when I was working with a rugby, an all-women's rugby team, like, one, these are hardcore women, and two, <laughs> they are taped within an inch of their life. Like, they have all of these weakened joints and all these different things. Like, I had one girl, both of her knees were, were crazily taped up. Like, I would tape up AC joints and all these different things because of, um, because, because these individuals, rather than, like, being squares and going resting their limbs and injuries and making sure they heal properly they would rest a little bit and then go back out into the field taped up and then never give their um their joints and injuries the, a full chance to really heal and so you get this chronic weakening um that has to be supported with tape so 
I think that a lot of people, like a lot of these girls would just, if, if they couldn't play without tape, like they would just get demolished out there. Um, yeah, they really, they really relied on, on taping as, um, as a uh, primary stabilizer. Yeah. So we never allow people to return to play, to return to competition. So sometimes they say like, oh, can you wrap me up? And we can say, sure, but you're not allowed to go back into the field. And that's enough for them to make the decision to not get wrapped up or they can, um, they can find me elsewhere. Um, you don't want to tape and wrap if you're unsure of the nature and extent of the injury. You've done like your assessment process, but it's not enough for um, like I mentioned before, sometimes you don't get the full story in the acute stage. So you really need to, you need like a week or a couple of weeks to, to get the full idea of what the person's impairment is as the swelling has gone down, if you're able to isolate um, the pain with ranges of movement, that kind of thing. Yeah, me too. Yeah, chronic injuries. Yeah, people, people really take their bodies for granted and um, they don't really understand the extent at which um, chronic injuries can cause issues later on. Yeah, I, yeah, one of my classes was like really heavy on taping and um, it is really interesting and it's really cool. And um, the other thing about taping though is that um, it's not just about um, the potential of that person getting injured. It's like if you don't apply the tape properly, so with like foam padding, with Vaseline, with all of these different things that protect the skin itself, like you can actually cause minor wounds to that, to that person. Um, because because the tape is so sturdy and so sticky, um, it's basically like hockey tape. Um, if you don't know how to apply it, then um, you can cause someone injuries. <laughs> there it is, yeah. Um, especially taping wrapping, it, don't do it if the function is impaired, the area is irritable and subject to swelling. Um, yeah, you don't want to, because again, because tape is so sturdy, like the wrap with its elastic properties allow some swelling while applying compression, but tape just won't do that. And um, it can really cause a lot of damage. That's right. Yeah. Not with an MFR even. Yeah. Scope of practice. Yeah. So this is just for, um, just for uh, your interest sake. It's, um, I think it's, it's really interesting to share. And um, I, I always find that people really enjoy listening about it. So yeah our muscles are the prime primary dynamic stabilizer like they are our muscle and bones the way that they work together the musculoskeletal system is really amazing at what it does and tape is just really a poor substitute for what the muscles nature is supposed to do so we really want to support the the muscle um to get back to its full function because it will do way it, it will do a job its job for the most part much better than any kind of additional crutch or structure that you can apply to it Okay. And as with everything, like you need to document everything that you've done, everything that you've asked and any advisement that you've given them. So it's really important to advise them to follow up with a doctor or a physiotherapist. Um, it, 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 I would recommend one over the other, depending on what you think the nature of their injury is. Um, I don't know any physios, I could be wrong, that can um, refer someone for an x-ray. So doctors would be the ones to do that. But if you're pretty solid that like what you have is a sprain or strain, like your physio is the, is the primary way to go because they have, um, so, I, so like, so I, in my um, domain of kinesiology, I can like, obviously I have this, this set of information I can give you that kind of thing, but physiotherapists really go to school for, for um, an in-depth amount of time to be able to apply a bunch of different tests that can isolate the, areas of injury and to apply appropriate um, modalities, even more than just like the stretch heat that we've given you. They can do a lot of cupping. Some can even do some dry needling. So um, a physio is really the way to go if you feel pretty solid that what you have is a pretty straightforward um, MSK injury. So yeah, one or the other sometimes, just because I know that doctors are often overloaded. And to be honest, like no offense to doctors out there, but they um, don't get a lot of training in soft tissue injuries and um, are kind of like at a loss of what to um, provide their patients with. So, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was, okay, good. Thanks, Dr. Mike. <laughs> All right. Okay. 
So going back to our assessment model, we're comparing active range of motion to passive and resisted. So we're coupling the active and passive together, which will give us information on what is potentially um, the injured tissue. Resisted will give us additional information of the severity of that injury. Um, and then what we do after in terms of like, what kind of care can we give that, that patient? Um, or maybe say like, you know what, there's not very much care I can give you now. What you will do in the following weeks to months is going to dictate the, the speed of your recovery and the depth of your recovery. And um, yeah, that's about it. Thank you so much for listening in. Um, we, I feel like we made fairly good time. Hopefully this wasn't a duress to listen to me as I repeated the same things over and over again. Um, yeah, feel free to, to um, post some, if you have any additional questions or comments or suggestions, things that need clarification, um, let me know. Oh, good. I'm so glad, Patricia. Yeah, I only I only feel bad because. Uh... <laughs> okay, great. Yeah, I only feel bad because there was there's a lot of more movement that I do when I'm in front of a classroom versus um, just in front of a screen. So. I'll just jump in here for a second while we're waiting to see if anyone else has other questions coming in there. Uh, thanks so much, everybody, for coming out. We really do appreciate it. Next week, we're going to take a slight diversion from medical topics. We've got uh, our DS here in Victoria, Anna Stefik, uh, who was roasting Natalia right at the beginning here. Uh, she's actually going to be talking about St. John Ambulance contributions uh, and their involvement in World War I and the general war effort um, as we're running into Remembrance Day. So that'll be a really great topic, uh, something Anna's got a lot of interest and background in. So we're really interested, looking forward to see that. Otherwise, I'll give it a few more minutes for questions to pop up here, but otherwise we'll close it out. Thanks so much, everybody. Ooh, Thanks, Natalia. Going health. No prob. My pleasure. Hopefully it was clear. <laughs> I always feel like I am giving a very muddled presentation. <laughs> Cadets and Crusaders. Oh, interesting. I wonder if I would, yeah. I would have to think about um, the age range and like what I would be able to, what I would need to rework some things. But yeah, I would be down for that for sure. No problem. Thanks for your questions. I really appreciate that. Um, so it takes Nick a few days to process these videos, but we will be posting them to YouTube. So you can <laughs> yeah. I have a couple of like recordings of myself out there. I did a different presentation for a different group, a totally other topic. And like, I'm, I'm tempted to watch them so I can learn about how to better present. <laughs> I don't want to watch myself. <laughs> <It's> miserable. <laughs> No, I'm in Port Alberni, Mike. I just moved up island. <laughs> Chris, is that are you trying to sweeten the deal? Because that doesn't seem sweet. <laughs> oh yeah, Re Rebecca, it's it's um, I I can even give you um. I can even give you an example now if you want to hold up because I know that there's very little movement, very little room in the PCRs for the type of detail that you could write down and the type of uh, assessment that you could do. Um, so so I, would, I would say just give the pertinent information. You don't have to go crazy detailed with things. Um, so for example, I would write down like, um, I would write down um, like say like um, six on ten shooting pain shooting pain in a rom and b rom um, hold on 
Actually, hold on. This sucks. <laughs> I'm out of practice. Hold on. You're just giving the most pertinent information. Um, so my handwriting is really messy, but if you can see this, so I would just even write like something like six on 10, shooting pain, active range of motion, uh, colon, um, inflection, and then passive range of motion, pain in extension, like EXT, FL, like flex, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, like it doesn't have to be detailed. You're just you're just giving them the most um, again printed info. Um, it takes it takes some. Anna would have to dig out some of my old PCRs or other PCRs just um, because I can't really remember um, out of practice a little bit. But um, the more again, like with everything else, the more that you practice it, the more that you can kind of distill what's important to write down on the PCR, um, and you can always attach additional sheets. Um, I, I would always say, write down whether I advise someone to seek higher help because, um, I mean, it's important because uh, you want to be able to um, shift the liability and the care to someone who is better equipped to take care of it. Um, what else would I put down? Yeah. Oh, Foosh, yeah. Um, fun outstretch hand. Uh, yeah, like the, the one, like the acronyms that like I gave in the in tonight's presentation, like AROM, PROM, ROM. To be honest, like on a PCR, I would not even put down grades because those are not um, immediately discernible to the average person or to the person to to the average healthcare provider who might be looking at this at the sheet, like. I would write down like um, weak and painful, um, uh, weekend, whatever, or um, that kind of thing. Yeah, especially, yeah, that's right. Any, and yeah. Oh, <laughs> oh, sorry, sorry, Rebecca, I misunderstood. That's something that, um, yeah, that's, that exactly, Mike, that's right. Best to just state the findings, hold the interpretation. <laughs> the paperwork talk. That's not something that I often under, I'm not the one who undertakes that. That's something that Anna has done in the past for sure. Yeah. Yeah, and, and even like, I would, like my experience, paperwork in general is a type of um, thing to perfect. Like it's very easy to get crazy with it. Um, sometimes, the acronyms go over people's heads. For me, like I don't know very many acronyms. Um, I'm someone who is more likely to make them up, so it's better for me to refrain from them. Um, I, you want to go with um, definitely with brevity, and you, it's the balance between brevity and clarity for sure. Yeah. Okay, I'm just gonna hang out and wait until someone kicks me off, I guess, because there's still 17 participants. So if you guys still have questions or anything else, um, if you want to contact me with additional questions, you can um, talk to contact Div 176 and they'll forward your stuff to me. I'm going to pin, pull the pin there. Thank you so much, everybody. As Natalia said, if you do have any questions, send us an email, get in touch, and we will put you in contact with Natalia. Thank you so much for coming out, everybody. Have a great night. We'll see you next week.